Hey everybody, thank you for uh, for joining us here for Power Hour. Um, we're gonna get started here in a in a second, but uh, while folks are trickling in, um, Kevin is our illustrious guest today, head of sales at at, uh, at Top Funnel. Kev, you uh, you have had any travel recently that you want to share? <laughs> yes. Uh, anything exciting? Anything exciting go down? Hello, in, hello. In, Indeed, <laughs> yes. So um, I had quite the travel experience. Um, <laughs> my, my brother was married last week, um, nice. last Saturday. Have you ever heard nice. of Marfa, Texas? M-A-R-F-A. I have, I have now. Yeah, Marfa, Texas. Um, so they call it Far Out West Texas because it's far out there. It's also uh -huh. far out. So mm. it's so it's three hours um, east of El Paso. So I flew into El Paso, drew, wow. drove three hours in the desert to get to Marfa. And yeah. the reason that this is kind of a destination, there was this uh, artist called Donald Judd who moved there from New York City in the 1970s um, mm. and sort of made, put, put Marfa on the, at, on the map for so non texans yeah, so you yeah. kind of have like hip things going there. You have a bunch of art going on there. My brother living in Austin had been out there quite a few times, so he wanted to get married in Marfa. Um, so that's that's where I was. And nice. it was an incredible wedding. It was, it was wonderful. It was like so, so much fun. Um, on Friday, the day before, kind of the welcome party for all of the out-of-town guests, which everybody was out of town. You're right. was, um, Not a lot of Marfa locals showing up. Not there were a few. There were a few. You know, my my brother's a friendly guy. He makes friends everywhere he goes. So we did have a few locals. Um, but the welcome party was at this ranch, which was in between Alpine, Texas, and Big Bend National Park. Have you ever been on that road? It's like the surface of the moon. Yeah. Um, and so it was on this ranch. I cooked twenty five pounds of steak for all the guests um there was horses yeah. there was guns <laughs> and um was, mm, gun steak and beer i mean hey what else, yeah. what else could what could go wrong it sounds very this sounds like a texas wedding man yeah west texas, west wedding. texas there you go <laughs> wonderful well cool um so i think we have uh kind of our our quorum here so um hey everyone thanks for joining us for power hour uh, I'm uh, I'm your host Pete Kazanji. Um, just you know, because Power Hour is a really interactive, um, interactive experience. Uh, just to kind of help folks get familiar with uh, with the Zoom interface, please do use the chat and the Q and A as we're kind of jamming along here. There were a bunch of questions that were submitted ahead of time, but that's really kind of the idea here is that Kevin and myself are at your disposal for tackling your kind of like toughest questions here so like you know please do please do chat them please do uh please do use the do use the q a there um for so for folks who are not familiar power hour is hosted by modern sales pros msp is the world's largest revenue leadership community for those in sales management sales and revenue operations sales development and related disciplines and the community's mission is pretty straightforward it's to create an environment for our thirty thousand and growing members to answer questions they struggle to solve on their own help them see around corners they may not know about uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so the way that we do that is through live sessions, kind of like this. Uh, we have a robust online forum for kind of asynchronous Q&A. &A, and uh, we also do in-person events. And so for those folks who weren't previously in MSP, after this, you'll be added and that'll be fun. Um, so, you know, um, before we get started, just a couple of reminders here. Power Hour is a unique format. There's not really like a specific piece of content that, you um, that we're going to be going through and said the whole idea here is like q a right we have a bunch that was submitted ahead of time we have you know everybody here right now um so like as the as the spirit takes you please do uh ask your questions um and so you know um this is like you're here to learn so please do submit those questions um so with that let's go ahead and head into some introductions here i'll kind of make mine super quick because most people are familiar with me um i'm Pete kazanji i'm actually one of the founders of modern sales pros and also co-founder of uh of atrium atrium makes data-driven sales management software um that helps managers um ae sdr am csm managers use data to um to improve team performance and um, 
And we do that through, um, you know, a world-class metrics harness that takes five minutes to set up. You just connect your, uh, your, your Salesforce CRM and poof, you've got all the metrics you could possibly need. And then not only that, but they're, they're being monitored statistically by the software as well. So that's a little bit about me. Kevin, why don't you introduce yourself, man? Yes, happy to, Pete. Thank you. Um, so I'm the head of sales at Top Funnel. I've spent my career in recruiting technology, thanks to Pete giving me my start at Talentbin. <laughs> um, and what we do at Top Funnel is we help find candidates and turn them into colleagues for you. Um, so we're doing that with technology, passive candidate sourcing, referral generation, inbound filtering, scheduling, reporting on everything. Um, and we also have humans that we can parachute onto your team, bring that technology with them um, and use it to make those hires as well. I love it. Excellent. And then can you maybe share a little bit about like, kind of like what that sales motion looks like, who the, the personas are that you're selling to, kind of the average selling price, and also your, um, you know, the, 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 the prior roles that you've had or kind of the prior sales motions that you've worked on? Yes, absolutely. So um, we have a team of full desk account executives. Um, so, you know, we are prospecting, um, we are taking that initial you know, sort of call and running that initial sales cycle, which is usually about 30 to 60 days. Um, and, you know, typically in the about 20K range uh, on an average deal size, um, it can be quite larger, of course, it can be a little smaller. Um, and right, yeah, so full desk, and we can kind of talk a little bit more about that and um, why I think that's cool. What are the pros? What are the cons? Um, of course, when I uh, started uh, at Talentbin, I was an SDR, um, yeah, buddy. and we had SDRs, AEs, and uh, an account manager and a CS motion as well. Um, and you know, I think that that is important and helpful. Um, you know, when you're thinking about making sure somebody's laser focused, um, kind of you know, it's really clear what they need to do that day. Um, I'm an SDR, I prospect. Um, when we think about though, and, and I mean, that was <laughs> what, you know, 10 years ago, um, SDR, SDR ing um, was somewhat new at that point. Like, yeah, it's like, it's yeah. like a 20 year old technology or so. Like it was initially kind of like innovated by, um, Aaron Ross and, and team at uh, at Salesforce, and, and then like kind of documented in uh, predictable revenue. So the you know the Henry fortification of the sales process was, you know, not quite where it's at today. Um, you know, and yes, there's there's benefits to it, and I think, um, like I said, like it's clear what you need to do. Um, you know, you're focused on that one thing. That's what you're measured on. It's not. Uh, vague in any way. Um, however, you know, we all know too that like, if you're just doing that one thing, um, that can be tough as a person doing that thing, um, to continue to bring that motivation to continue to bring new things to it. Um, but what I always think about too, is from the customer's perspective, from the potential customer, from the prospect's perspective, um, right. you know, they're getting so much outreach, they're getting reached out to by that SDR, Maybe that SDR gets them on the phone, builds a little bit of rapport, asks a few discovery questions, learns a bit, of, learns a bit about their business, and then says, great, so you'll talk more with me. Okay, now meet this AE, new person. I told them everything that you told <laughs> me. You know, AE gets on the phone. That's, and says, that, oh. that, 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 that always happens. <laughs> right. Well, Mr. Customer, let me ask you the same questions the SDR asked. And we're back from scratch. <laughs> and the customer's like, shoot, why did I take this call? I don't have, I only have so many hours in the day. You know, okay, the AE gets past that. They build rapport. They go a little bit deeper. They learn more about the business. They convince them to spend money. Now meet your account manager, your CS. I told them everything, you know, <laughs> back to scratch, back to square one. So, so when you guys say that you guys have, do full desk, it's not just SDR plus AE. It's also the AM component as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Do you guys so, have, do you, you guys have, because like we're top funnel customers, um, we we do have a customer success person though. So that, that's the part that's abstracted. Right, right. So um, 
you know, the reason for keeping the AE, the salesperson attached throughout the process is part of that continuity um, and making sure that, um, you know, that kind of information is, is properly shared. Um, it's also, I mean, one of the ways that we've been super successful um, finding additional customers and growing our business has been through um, referrals and building yeah. strong relationships. So it's yeah. even more important to keep that person attached um, yeah. to make sure that, that that happens. But yes, the CS joins because there are so many hours in the day. And yeah. if the AE salesperson is a person having to also do the training and to you know, uh, tell the customer to refresh their screen, you know, and things like that, like that's not necessarily additive. Um, yeah. you so, know, and so essentially there's no commercial, there's, there's no abstraction in like the commercial motion. It's like the, the abstraction shows up in the, um, in the, in, in kind of like this success component. But I mean, I think there's an interesting point there, which is I, like, initially, if you think back to like the reason why uh, SDR AE abstraction first showed up, um, there are like, there is a reasons why, and also kind of like key enabling technologies. The interesting thing is like Salesforce itself was, which essentially is like a cloud CRM was like the key enabling technology to allow for that abstraction, because essentially what you could do is you could model like, Hey, here's an opportunity that was like, here are the leads or here are the contacts that we're then fi we're firing against. Right. And then we can model the opportunity and have some sort of like continuity. Now, maybe it's not the smoothest continuity right. <laughs> handoff right. there, but at least it's like modelable. So you can be like, oh, we forgot about X, Y, Z, that no showed or whatever. But then the reason why it was important at the time was because there wasn't really a lot of automation um, out yep. there to allow for account executives um, to have to have leverage like. I mean, the way that we had that at, at Talentbin, like we hacked together like a booty version of sales loft slash outreach before that right. even existed. Right. Actually, out, outreach before Yesware they- Yesware was upstairs. Yesware was brand new. It was like, whoa, yeah. Yesware, we can track emails and see if they opened them. Yeah. Yeah. Like like we used marketing automation software in the form of Acton to allow the SDRs right. to send like email, like drip emails, but like it was very kind of like hacky. Um, whereas now I think that there is more automation there. Now, the funny thing is, is like, I feel that like, a lot of teams haven't done a great job of enabling their sellers to have more automated leverage. How do you guys, because presumably you guys do that, right? In order to make it such that these, your team can, can prospect more effectively. Um, how do you guys use that? Do you guys just use like top funnel or do you guys use some sort of like sales engagement software um, kind of external from that? Yeah, that was, I mean, you know, when I first saw top funnel um, in, in one of our, forms, which is the outreach platform, which is primarily interacted with as the Chrome extension, which you can mm -hmm. take with you on LinkedIn, GitHub, Stack Overflow, even Twitter. What it is, is, you know, okay, I'm on peak Zanji's LinkedIn profile. I'm going to hit the top funnel extension. I'm going to run this campaign on him. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to open the compose window for the first message. I'm going to do a little personalization. The squirrel is cute. I'm going to talk about the squirrel and the subject line. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to hit send and top funnel is going to find the email, validate it, kick off the campaign. So I was like, oh yeah. Okay. You know, so, you, so you guys stuff. use, you, you, you guys platform. essentially use it. You use a recruiting tool for, uh, right. for pro prospecting. Yeah. And I think actually probably, so for folks who would want like, you know, an actual sales tool for this, as opposed to <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like, well, you know, yeah, it's a recruiting tool, but like, you know, we get it a very affordable price of free for, <laughs> um, for us. Yeah. I think that's actually really interesting because the, the historical challenge with like a lot of sales engagement software, like outreach and, and sales level what have you is that it doesn't have the humans in it mm -hmm. um and i think this is why you know, when you look at um there's a company called apollo that's having like a ton a ton a ton of success they're actually an atrium customer um henry mizell is the vp of uh the vp of sales operations over there he's absolutely fantastic and um you know it comes along with its own database of like human yeah. objects right of contact objects I, right. I would presume they probably i actually haven't seen the interface but um, I, pr I would presume they probably have some sort of like Chrome extension functionality as that is with that as well. But I mean, so, so that's cool and all, but I think the one of the biggest things around kind of like specialization and abstraction is, is less about the, like, can this be done from a technical standpoint? It's more about like splitting your day. And so then how do you ensure that the account executives like 
like have the proper time on the calendar to make sure that they are doing that kind of prospecting behavior. Because like, I mean, we see this with all of our, like with, like HM's got like 300 customers, right? And like you have, you know, SMB, you know, SMB sales organizations, you got mid-market, you got enterprise sales organizations. And a lot of times in the enterprise, um, there's an expectation that the AEs are prospecting more. Right. Um, because oftentimes it can be, if you're, if you're selling into the enterprise and you're like entering through the C-suite, right? Or you're kind of coming top down. It can be a lot more effective for, you know, a grayer haired, like more tenured uh, seller to kind of crack that conversation, either through kind of like effective referral or, or prospecting or even just their Rolodex. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, a, a oftentimes getting a 30 something or a 40 something or a 50 something year old seller to like buckle down and actually like do that prospecting behavior can, uh, can oftentimes be a challenge because it's like less pleasant. Um, and we, this is actually a key use case for us. It's like literally like helping, helping organizations instrument it, like measure the amount of AE prospecting and outcomes coming from that. And like, you'd be shocked. And they're like, yeah, this is a huge problem for us because nobody wants to do it. How do you make sure that like your team is actually doing it? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many things, right? And I mean, part of it is um, what kind of personalities and what kind of people comprise your team and how do they think about prospecting? Do they think sure. about it as like, a, oh, they're beyond that? Or um, do they know in their hearts <laughs> that it's something we have to keep doing forever? <laughs> <laughs> and they're quite good at it because they have the knowledge. They talk to the customers, you know, they go real deep. They can send nice emails. And so, yes, you know, you can block some time for prospecting in the morning. Um, sure. Do you guys do that? Do you guys just like have a stripe? Like, like, like on this team in general, we, like from, from nine to 1030 is like the prospecting time. And you can book a customer, you can book a client meeting over that if you want to, but like, just don't do it too frequently. I don't mandate it on a team basis. They kind of block it on like in hours that work for them and try to steer it away from like prime time calling hours. Yeah. Like edges of the edges of the day. But with any like block, it's like, oh, but I've got this contract. This, you know, I need to do, I need to make sure these red lines happen and get this deal. Yeah. It's always, it's always like bottom. Yeah. You always, as, as Brad, as our, as our friend Brad Snyder would say, um, you know, you always want to work uh, closest to the money. Right. Um, But and also it gets back another piece of it. It gets back to what I was kind of like, one of the things that I sort of don't, I rail against is like, well, you know, okay, you can get like 40 or 50 emails out today, but were they 40, 50 good ones? Well, just do 10, you just do five, you know? Yeah. Um, and if you do it right and you make them good, you're going to get, especially now, especially today. And so like, how do I mean that? Like, what does that look like from our perspective? That could be um, finding somebody who was a really successful recruiter on top funnel. And now they've gone somewhere else um, you know, and we're like, Hey, congrats on the new role. Like love to catch you up on new things. Like that outreach converts quite oh, well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, fully. We, yeah. um, we actually have our, a play for that. Um, our SDRs do it and we use some software that kind of follows our prior, um, prior clients. Um, it's, uh, there's mm-hmm. a couple of different softwares for the, that we use one called SIF data. There's another company called user gems that lets you do that. We're essentially just like monitors. It's like, it's like sales lofts, uh, right. original product, uh, LinkedIn job change alert or whatever the hell it was like way back yeah. in the day before they had prospector before the LinkedIn was like, no, <laughs> no more <laughs> taking away the punch bowl. And they pivoted into uh, sales loft cadences. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. And I think, I mean, to your point, like it's a good thing to, so yes, it's, it's challenging, I think, to kind of just like fully, fully mandate. Now, what I like to do is I like to have strenuous suggestions um, <laughs> around like, around, oh, don't like, say. yeah, I, I don't say, I don't say how weird yeah. um, the, um, <laughs> but you know, one of the things that we talk about here on the atrium sales team, this may have been a, a post talent bin coinage, or maybe when we talked about it at, at talent bin as well, it's like, look, uh, like a calendar is destiny, right? And so if you're not putting time on the calendar to make, make, you know, make sure that something's happening, it's, it's highly unlikely it's going to happen. Um, that, that doesn't mean you can't stomp on it, right? Like, oh man, I got to really work on these red lines right now. But ideally what you're doing is you're not deleting that, like that block on the calendar. You're just like, you're, yeah, you're doing a little like Tetris, right? Like little, little calendar battleship, right? We're kind of like, oh, I'm going to move it over. I'm going to move it over here in, um, 
instead. And then of course, like you just got to have accountability over <clears throat> like the measuring the quantity and the quality of that, of that activity. And I think your point is well taken, which is like, hey, look, just like spamming out 50 emails or whatever on a daily basis, uh, uh, especially if you have the subject matter expertise. And like, this is the nice thing about account executives, like they can talk business, right? And this is one of the things that we try to do with our SDRs is like, the faster you can get them up the learning curve. And at, at Atrium, we do a bunch of things around this with our SDRs. Like we have them read like Leading Sales Development by Jeremy Donovan. We have them read, read Cracking the Sales Management Code by uh, by, by uh, Jason Jordan. Required reading from Pete. I loved it. It was great. Yeah, right. And and so the, that gets them up the learning curve faster, but like AE is just kind of like swimming it all day long. So yeah. like use that to your advantage. And then of course, what would end up happening is Yes, you're going to see the email volumes and the you know the unique number of contacts being engaged. Like, you know, when you're measuring that, it's going to be lower, but the email responsiveness rates are going to be way higher, right? right. And the act the activity levels required in order to engender an opportunity are going to be highly more efficient than with an SDR. So, kind of like comes out in the wash. Uh, kind of on that topic, um, you know, I think we're in a really competitive sales hiring market at least right now, although with like the market doing what it's doing right now like the amount of like layoffs that are happening like maybe maybe sales hiring will get a little less uh, uh you know less less problematic <laughs> but but um you know it's obviously a very competitive hiring market right now um mm -hmm. what are some of the ways that you guys have gone about like getting in front of account exec like to your point earlier about like hey like you know it's just the mindset about the, the people that we recruit a, how do you like? How do you guys recruit? How do you guys get in front of the folks who are going to be like good fits for you? Um, obviously, like detecting from external I indications that somebody is like okay with prospecting is probably not going to be something you're going to be able to do on like on LinkedIn or what have you. But certainly, like engendering initial conversation is something that like um, most people struggle with. Um, how do you guys? How do you guys approach that? I mean, I imagine you guys probably use Top Funnel for that. There's only two ways we make hires at Top Funnel. Mm -hmm. Top Funnel and referrals. There's no other way. Mm -hmm. That is the way. Um, and yes, you know, I mean, the first step is getting somebody on a call. And I mean, you know, in this moment in 2022, it's uh, quite competitive. Um, and it's, it, you know, we're a remote company completely. Um, and that used to be a little bit more distinct. Um, so it's not, you can't just go find somebody in Madison, Wisconsin, because other people are, are looking in Madison, Wisconsin as well. And we'll see, we'll see how some companies kind of change their policies and how that affects. And we actually have a little bit of, of data on that too. Um, but, uh, you know, so my, my point here is there's a lot of outreach going to a lot of people and, where in the past you might be able to dangle salary compensation and benefits and um you know use that it's like anybody anybody can do that to to a point right. right um so from a candidate's perspective it's less about that these days um and it's more about um alignment with the company's mission and the culture that's that's there how do you, do you, like, does that show up in kind of your initial outreach messaging, like in your campaign, like your top funnel campaigns, or, or is it more just kind of like, you know, like provocative outreach in order to engender like a 15 minute meeting, and then you're able to kind of like sell more, more fulsomely in, in like a synchronous conversation, or do you get like, does that show up in the first, like, are you kind of like qualifying, qualifying slash, like, attracting and pushing away in the, in the, some of the first messaging? Well, you know, um, telling somebody about like the company uh, culture in an outreach is kind of hard, but they might get a sense of it based off the way you've written the email, um, you know? And so, and I mean, millions of recruiting emails go through our systems every day, um, mm -hmm. you know? So we're able to kind of get a sense of what catches candidates eyes and what doesn't. Um, That's a good point. So, like a succinct to the point email, hey, this is why you, you know, and this is why us, are you open to a quick chat? I mean, it, it really is that simple. Yeah, versus just like a wall of, uh, yeah, a wall of, a wall of text. I mean, 
Right. <laughs> sounds like sounds like tells, that actually sounds like very good SDR outreach or right. AE prospecting outreach. Totally. It's like, yo, yo, Kevy, you're you know you're the head of sales over there at uh you're the head of sales over there at Top Fun. I see that you don't have any sales operations folks over there. I imagine oh. all the like all the dashboard diving that uh, you wish you could be doing is probably a huge pain. You know, would you be open to learning a little bit more about how people how customer A B C D you know, automates all that with Atrium. Also, I'll send you a nice little, uh, you know, coffees for closer Yeti, you know, would you be opposed? Would you be opposed? Right. 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 Um, I love right. it. One thing that we've found success with, and let me drop this in the chat here. Um, I'm a big, you know, marketing collateral guys, as Kevin knows. Um, we used to joke, we still joke that like Pete just like emits slides, just slides just kind of <laughs> like fly out of him, right? Um, and so one of the things that I've put together is a like a candidate experience. To your point about like it's hard to um, express that in a in an email. Yeah. So what we try to do is we say, hey, if you want to learn a little bit more about us, it doesn't show up in the first email. I don't think we do link to it from our um, our job postings, um, and people like it. Like it's just you know, a little slide deck around the atrium, kind of like little tours. Yeah, totally. uh, a little bit, a little bit on the product, like a little bit on like some of my former staff. You're not listed on there, Kevin, because I don't love you as much as my other children. Nah. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, but, but people really like it because it, because it's actually fairly distinctive or like differentiating from from most folks. Even though if you look at it, like the production value on that deck is like. Yeah, B minus, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so that's actually something that 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 we've found to be very successful, and Absolutely. and people are like, yeah, people like it. Um, yeah. So so kind of like um, changing gears a little bit. You guys sell to um, to HR. It's like I mean, right. my like we actually over here at Atrium, <laughs> we have a really fun sales motion <laughs> because all we do is like sell to sales sales leaders like yeah. sales managers sdr yeah. managers like, cool. sales, like what do you got vp of sales got? yeah <laughs> totally you know? it, yeah see. it's like yeah, yeah it's 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 pretty funny like i mean it, it has a bunch of different kind of pieces to it where like it's it definitely has the like hey we're we're like we're talking the same language here like don't bullshit a bullshitter like yeah. literally our aes will agenda set and be like cool so we're probably going to do about five minutes of disco and then what we'll do is right. we'll pivot to xyz like literally say hey i'm going to go ahead and set an agenda okay yeah you should set an agenda right like good job yeah. right yeah. like yeah. we're going to yeah. do five minutes of discovery like um and and it's actually really kind of really really fun for them aside from the fact that like we we do sell on customer data as well like because AEs turn on customer accounts in like five minutes and then the sales process from there is like pilot driven, but but HR is not necessarily like that, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and it's not just HR, um, it's it's other environments where you have people like are maybe like less a um, little bit more reticent to be sold to, and and recruiting is different than HR, but like I would love to kind of get your perspective on like you know, the ups and downs of selling to HR or recruiting and, and what have you and how that's, you know, how that's different. And I actually, I guess your prior company, Videolicious, you were selling to marketing, I want to say? Um, well, we would sell to HR and recruiting as well for like hiring manager videos. Um, oh, I see. But then, yeah, like marketing, internal and external communications, as well as using video in sales was a component. Now, getting a sales rep to make a video um, you know, at scale is, uh, is problem. It's, it's a um, thing. It's, it's a whole thing. thing. It's a thing. Um, but we, we, mm -hmm. we sold to, uh, to talent teams then as well. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and it kind of relates to, oh, you're using a recruiting product for sales. Well, I mean, let's break it down. Well, okay. So what, what is recruiting? Okay. I have a job description. Selling. I need to go, I need to go find people that meet these requirements ideal customer profile. Okay, cool. Now I need their contact information. Now I need to construct a good template email with a little bit of personalization and follow up. Ooh, they responded. I need to get back to them quickly and get them scheduled, get them on that first call and move them through a process. You know, it's the same thing. Um, you're offering money. You're not asking for it, you know? So well, yes, 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 I know though. This, I mean, this is always the challenge with like selling to corporate recruiters, though. Is like they don't have quotas. Yeah, yeah. They don't. They don't. They, they don't have quotas, and they and like um and they don't necessarily make commissions. Now, agency recruiters certainly do, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I I wonder if that's like you know selling to organizations that don't necessarily have like numerical accountability, um, kind of makes it such that you can't just be very brass tacks. 
like use us as an example. We can be selling to an, uh, an AE manager and be like, look, you're going to, if you're able to take your average rep attainment instead of like 60% of your reps hitting quota or 70% of reps hitting quota instead of 80% of your reps hit quota because you like raise their win rates or raise their activities or whatever through better like measurement and management using something like, like Atrium. That's like, that's a new BMW M5 for you, right. his customer, right? And they're like, oh yeah, that is right. Like it's going to be make me more successful and make me a better, like be a VP of sales when I grow up, but also I'll get my my new M5, right? right. That That's kind of a harder argument to make for, you know, to an HR person or like a finance person or, or what have you, right? Well, I would say a couple of things. So first, there is a very wonderful to see, I would say, movement of being more data driven in recruiting these days um and you know we can kind of provide a lot of that data you need to be able to make the kind of arguments that would have been harder for recruiting leaders um, to make in the past without that kind of insight how many sure. people to reach out to um mm -hmm. you know what what does the diversity look like from the top of the funnel um which hiring manager is letting candidates stay in you know without feedback for too long and so we're losing candidates like that kind of yep. thing you need that thing um to be able to take to the business and then you know justify making changes getting more people getting help mm -hmm. um the other piece though too is is because like so and um, you know, it's always, it's it, like, what does somebody care more about? Right. I forget, I forget the story. You're going to know what I'm talking about though. It's like, is it <laughs> mean 2000 more dollars or losing $50, right? You care more about losing yeah. $50 and not having a butt in a seat is like, that's a play way you lose money. So that same like argument for, um, you know, getting, getting your, your sales force and your, your atrium data, right. So that you have reps hitting quota, it's a similar thing when you don't have enough AEs because those are not enough people that are holding that number. Um, and, you know, are not- you guys, you're Right, gonna, you're so it's like selling them. selling through recruiting, but with like a sales value proposition. Do you guys ever interact with them, um, with sales, like a VP of sales, like go around recruiting and like engage with the VP of sales and like, look, you're never gonna hit your number if you're not able to put butts in the seats and you're probably paying like, you know, $10,000 or $15,000 rips to, um, to recruiting agencies. Let's just go ahead and like automate that and uh you know let's be on our on our merry way now presumably they're not going to be state like that vp of sales or sales manager wouldn't be sourcing using top funnel oh yeah i'd be surprised that's the, that's the that, that's the that's the that's the uh you'd be surprised like should there be is a question that i think is worth asking um yeah and um, I never want to go around recruiting. I want to partner with them, but the closer we can get to helping the hiring manager, the better, because yeah, that's, you know, the VP of engineering, they don't yeah, they're the first out of the pain. They're going to miss their ship. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I mean, there's like, so, uh, one person comes to mind, Adam Lawrence from bolt, um, you know, was using top funnel himself there. He's founded a new company called boom and bucket first software purchase. He made his top funnel. He's yeah. sourcing himself. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we 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 did this. Like, I, 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 yeah, I, I've sort I've sourced a couple of AEs. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. We're, we're small though. We don't have a recruiting a recruiting function just yet. But like, yeah, we use. I mean, what is the product called? Streams or what is it like? Yeah, the thing that we, automates. We will find you candidates um, based off your requirements, and then you approve yeah. reject. Approve outreach goes out. Reject it doesn't. I like that one because I'm too lazy to be on LinkedIn. No, I'm just too busy yeah. to be on LinkedIn. But um, yeah, yeah like. So, okay, I, I see. So it, it can be a situation, you know, I think that's actually, there's a really good kind of like characterization there around, um, around like what makes the prospect tick? Like, do they want that M3 or are they really broken up about the fact that they're letting down their VPE? Right or their VP of sales, what and what have you, and so like kind of more focusing on the emotionality there, um, in discovery. Like, hey, yeah, you know, what's going to happen? What would be the uh, negative implications associated with not getting enough? You know, not not getting those sales oh. reps in the seat for the for the B, VP of sales. Like, how do you right. feel about that? Like, what's going to happen to the business? And well, and also, I mean, so I mentioned the movement of more. Uh, more data-driven uh, recruiting leaders and recruiting organizations. Mm -hmm. um, historically also, I mean, you know, 
like, let's face it, that the talent leaders have not been treated as well, um, how they deserve to be treated as the VP of sales or the VP of engineering. And now in this moment, you know, at the beginning in January one, it was something like 6,000 recruiter postings went up. It's harder to hire a recruiter than it is to hire an engineer right now. And, you know, so they're actually getting a little bit more of their due, which is, which is really nice because I mean, when a VP of sales says, I don't have time to source, that's a recruiter job. And then they, you know, don't show up to an interview or they reject a good candidate because of some dumb thing on their resume, um, right. you know, and, and then they say, oh, well, my recruiter wasn't being, bringing me candidates. It's like, <laughs> you know, I mean, you should get a lot more involved in the hiring process because that person's going to be on your team. And that's, you know, okay, oh, I'm the VP of sales. I'm about the number. It's like, well, okay, but- Where does that come from? Yeah, yeah, who's on your team? Who's going to help you hit that number? Um, go, fi- go help find that person. Be, be the first person to talk to them, even. Um, that's interesting. You know? do, you, do you guys ever do that with um, <clears throat> when you're partnering with the recruiters? And they're like, oh man, I don't know if there's, there's budget for this. And it's like, okay, well, you know, presumably if you're not hitting your, your sales hiring targets for the VP of sales, your engineering hiring targets for the, for the VP of engineering, like they have budget. They do. Why don't, why don't like, sound like, um, Hey, if I'm hearing this right, Kevin, you're really excited about using this and you see that how this could like really provide a lot of leverage for you and uh, you know, make you more, more efficient. Just sounds like maybe there's kind of like a budgetary limitation there. Question for you um, over in, in sales land, they buy a lot of, they buy a lot of software. Right? They, buy, they, uh, they, they fly all over the place. They uh, you know, they take people out to dinners and things like that would um, you know, oftentimes what we find is uh, you know they would be really open to to being a little bit of a budget donor for you. Oh, never even thought about that. Well, that's because you're not a seller, and that's what my job is. Yes. Right? Do you, you guys ever pull that play? Yeah, totally. I love I love getting the head of sales involved or the head of engineering involved as well, and you know especially the head of sales because it makes so much sense to them from like a prospecting and like kind of pipeline oh, yeah. perspective. Oh, we use uh, outreach for this. We use sales yeah. for this, or we use yeah. Apollo for this. Right. And they'll get a hold of it and they'll go like source 50 people on like, you know, at 11 PM one night and like the outreach is coming from them. It's written from their voice and, you know, shocker that, that kind of outreach helps, you know, so (laughs) um, getting them involved in as many ways as you can um, makes for better hiring outcomes, um, Mm. both in terms of being able to hire people faster, but also hiring people that stick around longer and contribute um, at a higher rate. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier kind of on the topic of like AE prospecting and what have you um, around um, facilitating account executives to do um, to do referrals. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's actually a really interesting, like it's related to the, the full desk piece, but also it's just like related to more like kind of modern SaaS. And what I mean by that is there's like, there's obviously like old school on-prem software where you like, you know, buy a perpetual license or whatever. And then there was like, kind of SaaS 1.0, like Taleo or, you know, fill in the blank, like Salesforce, where you're, like, you're buying a year, or you're maybe you're buying like three years of it or whatever. And so um, there really wasn't much of an incentive. And like, you can see this, like if anyone's ever used Taleo, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. well, there, there wasn't a huge incentive to, um, to make sure that people could get to like, you know, rapid value very quick, quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, of course, that doesn't really engender a lot of like customer love, like, oh man, this thing gives me superpowers in like week two or week three or week four or what have you. That's like super different now, right? Like the, the, the kind of the game has changed and it's really important for people to be able to get to utility quickly. But then if they get to utility quickly, now they're like, wow, that Kevin guy, he like, he wasn't blowing, you know, he wasn't blowing smoke. Like this, this, yeah, yeah. Like he wasn't, yeah, he like, he wasn't full of, he wasn't full of malarkey. Um, like this, this top funnel thing does really slap or like, oh man, you know, uh, Sean wasn't, Sean wasn't making this up. Like, you know, all now all my AE managers are like managing with data. This is really cool. This atrium thing is like really, really badass. Um, I'm so glad that I, you know, I'm so glad that I bought this wonderful what are we going to do with that right from a from an organizational standpoint obviously right. marketing loves it because they're like oh let, let's let's record some customer testimonials or whatever but 
but I think that you can get a lot more tactical around that and like it, like proactively elicit uh, referrals and what have you. It sounds like you guys do some some of that. How do you guys go about that? Well, absolutely. And like, you know, I mean, the, the AE is the person who just got that contract signed. And so instead of like, great, I got it signed. It's somebody else's problem. They're still there. So, yeah. you know, their personality and like the way their brains are wired is more urgent and more fast moving to begin with, but then yeah. still having their name attached um, and being there helps bring that urgency to that speed to value thing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then, so, yeah, so, so sticking around with that account and making sure that they are seeing value and, you know, um, they don't like, it, it's not like they have to go to all the checking calls and all the new user trainings or something yeah. like that, but showing up with QBRs to talk about, um, you know, how things have gone, um, is, is, is super, super helpful. Um, yeah. we, and, we, I mean, we, we do this with our A's and this is especially important in a land and expand motion, yeah. um, which I imagine that you guys probably have that. Cause like you probably, oftentimes you'll probably have somebody start with like a seat of top funnel or like right. maybe one, one, one job, sl- like one job slot, um, yeah. or, uh, or, or what have you. Um, and then right. you, know, you want them to consume more. So like making sure that they get to value initially, we, we do this as well, because oftentimes what we'll do is we'll just start with like a single team, like an SDR, like one of the SDR teams or one, like one of the AE teams or whatever, but like, obviously, that like, you know, $5,000 of spend or like $7,000 of spend or whatever is like not where we want it, like not the end state. Like we want to get to the, like, you know, go across the entire account right. and get to, you know, 30K or 40K or, or what have yeah. you. But but like trying to do that up front, like we'll just tank your win rates, right? Because yeah. like everybody's got to say yes. Anybody can say no, it kind of sucks. And so what we've done there is, and we actually learned this from a bunch of our um customers because like you know we have a bunch of land and expand customers like figma is a great example what have you and so they need to keep like keep hanging out so we actually have the way that we model this in the crm is the customer success manager is like the owner of the account but then we have a secondary lookup field on the account object that's like it's called ae owner and then what's kind of cool about that is that we actually use census to pipe a bunch of like usage data into onto the contact objects in in salesforce so we actually have like okay here's the six people who are licensed and like these five right here like they're trailing 30 page views or like they're hitting the cover off the ball this is the number of like views they're they're paying attention to this is the number of features like they're they're using lots of different features Uh oh this person's kind of like being a little bit of a laggard um they the AEs get that actually we actually have this hacked together in salesforce um they get that alerting alongside the the CSMs right like oh hey here's a really healthy account eighty percent of the of the um eighty percent of the users are using like using the hell out of it right or oh uh oh like usage is deteriorating in this account let's like let's get ahead of that we haven't done as much around kind of like proactive like referral elicitation and um I would love to hear kind of like how you guys go about that if you do I think you indicated that earlier or is it more just like like organic and kind of just like shows up by hanging out well i mean yes it is organic and yes it does show up by hanging out um and so does like learning about additional things um that is on the customer's mind um Mm -hmm. you know new jobs that are coming down the pipe do they have capacity for it do they need help with it um so just of course by spending more time with them you're gonna learn more about how you can help them further um talent professionals are quite connected with each other. Yeah, that's true. Right. Um, and so are salespeople. Dude. Right. Dude, right. Natural, natural extroverts. Right. And yeah, I'm like, you know, I mean, sales nav has a nice feature for it. We also, we sometimes even use our product teamable for this, for people who are like, for people who are really tight, they will upload their networks. And then it's like, Hey, cool. Mm. Um, you know, it looks like Pete has a ton of jobs as well. Do you, would you like mind introducing me to Pete? Would that be okay? You know, I'm like, here's a template on what you can use to, to introduce us. This actually reminds me of Pukar. He had some security pal customer as well. And um, mm-hmm. he had a, he, his AE had a nice, wonderful template for me that I could just like forward on. 
um, you know, to people that were in my network. He sat, he went through them with me. and was like, is this a good person? Is this a good person? Is this a good person? No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, here's the template. Okay, made it easy for me because you're asking for the customer to do something. Um, you know, so obviously you need to make it easy and you need to earn the right to ask. Nice. I like it. Um, when you're, when you're doing that, the, the kind of the, re the referral stuff, um, is that something that you guys like end up instrumenting at all? Or, or is it just something that like, like it's a play that the, that the team knows that they can, they can be doing and they, you know, they do it or they don't. Um, well, what do you mean by instrument? Like, I just measure like, Hey, this is like, like a lead source, like yeah, the oh, number, yeah. like the number of ops that are coming out of it or, or what have you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, and that's one of the reasons that makes us want to continue to double down and invest on it is because like, and I mean, one of the new members of my team came on and he, he ran this report in Salesforce as well. And it's like, hey, Kevin, all our, like, like 70% of like close one revenue as like a lead source referral. Like, let's do more of that, you know? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, duh. Yeah, duh, okay um let's yeah so it is it's uh in salesforce as like lead source where does it come from like referral and then you the actual name of the referral so we know you know who are uh who are the most generous as yeah. well mm. how do you um how do you guys end up because i think one of the things that you kind of noted there is like you hang out and you learn more things this is something that I've been working with our customer success team to do yeah. a kind of more muscular job on it. We call it rediscovery, rediscovery, like always, because yeah. oftentimes, and the AEs are the same, same situation. They think that like discovery is like, there's a couple of problems. They think that discovery is, um, is about like learning about them, like the prospect. Um, whereas the reality is, is that like really effective discovery is like, like, I almost feel that the better phrase would be like mutual discovery or or what yeah. have you because like really good kind of like uh like socratic uh like discovery can reveal a lot to the the prospect such yeah. that they can be like oh man i didn't even realize that like i have no automation happening in my in my recruiting organization or oh man i didn't even think about the implications associated with not hiring enough account executives for the vp of sales right. and how that has like negative implications for the for the business or what have you so that's the first problem that organization like that sellers will have the second problem is they right. stop right they're like oh okay i've got like my two or three use oh, cases and i'm on my way away what's that yeah, I got my questions answered. Okay, I checked my boxes. I asked, I asked my questions. Um, okay, now let me demo you. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. Versus, and and this is something that we kind of push on in, 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 in Atrium land is we say, hey, what we're doing from a customer success standpoint is like we're identifying or revealing use cases and then fitting solutions to it. Um, like, oh, right. okay, cool. You didn't realize that you have a, a pipeline hygiene problem in your organization. You you thought when you bought Atrium, you just were hiring a bunch of account executives. It's really important to track progress of their of their ramp from a pipe build and like you know a precursor standpoint. That's like pretty much why you bought Atrium. Well, here we are, like six months later, and it turns out like everybody's got a pipe hygiene problem, right? Or you have like a sales motion analysis problem or whatever. Mm -hmm. How do we then like reveal that? to them or like elicit that incremental use case because like the more embedded you can be like use you guys as an example the more campaigns that are being run the, the more embedded top funnel is the more utility the customer is getting out of it you know the tighter the partnership is the higher the nrr is the less likely someone's going to churn right yeah totally um and you know also like just based off the way that uh our company has kind of grown as well to your point earlier is like they might start working with us for one thing, let's call it sourcing and outreach. We start running the outreach. Yeah, you know, the first thing we need to make sure is like, are we actually getting responses and interested responses? Okay, um, we're getting interested responses. Great, are the interviews happening? Are you having trouble scheduling? You know, oh, people aren't getting, like that happens. You, you know, like I've seen that before where it's like customers unhappy, you go and you look at the responses and like, wait, but these candidates aren't getting followed up with. There's interested candidates in your inbox. Are they being followed up with? You know, um, so Clara, our scheduling product, Clara doesn't forget right. about any candidates. Clara makes sure all the candidates get followed up with and show up on calendars. So, okay, yeah, let's let's think about that. Let's think about improving the scheduling process. 
Um, yeah. You know, and, and for some companies, outreach, like just passive candidate uh, outreach is going to be hard. Yeah. Um, so you want to lean more into your network um, to generate referrals and volume recruiting might not be the path for you. You need to be more, um, you know, personalized. I mean, mm -hmm. that's one of the ways we hired one of our early foundational engineers. If he found like something cool he built and sent him an outreach about the cool thing he built. And I was like, okay, we'll talk. And then once you're on the phone with somebody, you're on the phone. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like earning. I mean, I think there's a couple of cool things there. Like one is one thing that I've um, kind of push on um, the team to do. And like, this is, this is tough from a training standpoint is like discovery is like a decision tree and, mm -hmm. and what you, what you need to do is like, if you run into a dead end, that's okay. Like, because usually a, the, the answer in that dead end probably indicates some other problem. Yeah. Right. And so uh, empowering your account executives to be able to, to like pivot like that. One thing that I did recently that's been really effective was, um, we call them second level questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so one of the challenges was like an AE would run into something like, I mean, they, they'd even, they, they'd ask their first level question, like as an example, like, Hey, Kevin, so like what, um, you know, what tooling do you use to measure the performance of your, of your team right now? Oh, well, like, you know, I use a, you know, I have a, I have a dashboard that I put together and, um, or like our former sales operations person person put together and you know then he left and but yeah and so it's okay right yeah. and so instead of just being like oh okay cool I got my answer it's like what's the next level like oh okay the next level there would be like oh okay wonderful like what sort of metrics are on there is like mainly like like lagging indicators kind of like bookings or like you know forward pipeline or kind of wins or things like that yeah yeah that's it for the most part oh okay well what about like leading indicators like about meeting volume or like opportunity advancements or like new opportunity inflow is that stuff on there oh it's not right oh, okay cool hey actually how for oh okay that's cool how frequently are you consuming that oh man like you know once a week maybe on sundays and okay come, on, come shoot me straight do you look at it every sunday no sometimes i skip right <laughs> okay cool right like yeah mm -hmm. totally you're a busy person right probably would be pretty helpful if that information came to you in, in a digested format right and so what we did or what i did was i created this document where there's like our disco questions there's like a con there's like common answers to to the disco question like i was just kind of noting there and then there's like here's here like here's common answer number one in that case second level question second level question second level question there here's common answer number two second level question second level question second level question and um and that's actually really helped the um help the reps because like rather than asking them to like organically accrete that that kind of like that decision tree over time, which of course is like even more challenging in a remote environment. Um, you've you've got them declared right there. Now the next thing I want to do is like have flashcards on it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Well, haven't quite haven't quite gotten there yet. It's it's Bill Walsh being prepared for every single possible, you know, scenario Play. game. But are you going to know what to do? You know, are you going to like yeah. and so so there's giving them like you can teach them the common uh, discovery answers and what questions to ask, but can you teach them the poise to take their time and yeah. be comfortable? You know, prospect gives you an answer, just sit there for a second, you know, and just be comfortable in the silence for a few seconds and think about it and then ask your next question. Don't, don't rush. And, you know, that is hard to teach. It has to be earned. One thing that helps um, is watching others, you know, so in the onboarding process, I make them watch a bunch of recordings. I make them go to calls and shadow them. Another thing that I love doing yeah. is telling them to go take demos from other people. Cause when you go and you see another person sell you, it's like, Oh, Oh, I know what he's, I know what they're doing right now. And then you're like, how are they doing it? Ooh, do I sound like that? I don't want to sound like that. Or that's really good. <laughs> I do want to sound like that. I should do something like that. Um, you know, I love that. I love, and that kind of gets back to where you were talking about before, where it's fun to sell to salespeople um, because they're, you know, well, they're just willing to to kind of take it further by default and kind of be curious and explore. 
um, which is another thing that's basically impossible to teach. But on the first call and the first interview, you can start to get a sense of it. Um, I think, I mean, uh, this is something that I talk about with, with sales leaders and, and I mean, I, I tell my reps this too, is that like, we're in the backbone installation business here. Like we want to install, we want to install backbones as quickly as possible. Cause like waiting <laughs> around, waiting around, um, for someone to like accrete that over time, um, is kind of like a recipe for, yeah. Yeah, like let's accelerate it, right? And how do how do we do that? And um, yeah, I just think that that's something that um, and like especially when you're you're selling in like a new category like we are, where look, this is some, some one of the things I tell my AEs and also CSMs is like, like because data driven sales management is kind of a very new concept, um, because like the data hasn't the data that you use in order to measure and improve rep performance hasn't really been around very long. So of course the muscles don't really exist, right? Um, but the reality is is that as a result, my AEs very frequently know far more about data driven sales management than the you know thirty something or forty something or fifty something year old um, mm -hmm. sales manager or sales leader that they're talking with, and so it can be hard for them to be like, but wait a minute, this person looks like my dad or my mom or, right. or what have you. And then like having the backbone to be able to say like, oh yeah, I've got it taken care of. It's like, huh, but but I think I heard earlier that you don't have a mechanism by which to like, you know, instrument the pipeline hygiene of your, of your reps and you're not tracking untouched opportunities. Like most of our customers find that that can be really problematic and negatively impact win rates. And, Am I thinking about this wrong? Right. Right. Like that can be, you know, a, like a provocative question like that can be tough for, for someone who hasn't had their like backbone fully installed. So totally. I think the mechanism, yeah, the mechanism by which you do that is you just have to like repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Yeah. yeah. To the reps and like get them like when, when we do trainings, it's, it's so funny. Like I'll see my reps like watching a video or whatever, or like, you know, like, like watching a video and like uh, of like uh, another rep's pitch or something yeah. I'm like watching is not learning. I want you verbalizing the things, right? right. Like we literally have a, a closing, we have a, a Google doc of like a dozen uh, closing phrases. Cause we have like a double close. There's like lighting up data and then there's like, you know, getting the business. Right. And, and so one of, the, one of the training things that we do is just have the rep, like the reps go and they say those sentences, like, 50 times each in the mirror <laughs> and then they do the next one and it's just getting the muscle memory going there such that like you're just eroding that kind of like hesitancy where it's like hey like it's, oh it just like tripped out of my mouth like hey kevin go ahead and share your screen we're gonna we're gonna turn on your free account oh okay cool right yeah. versus like oh you might say no it's like you've said that you know a thousand times right now so you're not going to be blo blocked at all and, and that i think that that's one of the mechanisms yeah. by which to kind of like install backbone is to get people like doing the motions as much as possible you're comfortable saying the words you're assuming they're going to say yes and when they say no fine yeah, yeah. there's there's plenty more yeah. right exactly yeah. It's but yeah we have a we have an abundance mindset right um wonderful well kev this is super awesome we are out of time i told you it would just fly by um Folks, thanks for joining us. We um, we have another wonderful guest next week. Um, we've got Robbie Halford, who's going to be joining us. He's the uh, head of sales enablement from uh, and field readiness at Heap Analytics. So he's absolutely fantastic. He's former formerly of Malwarebytes, uh, and now he's the uh, the VP of uh, sales enablement over there at Heap. Um, we'll be talking a bunch of we'll probably talk about uh, backbone installation with him as well. You know, as a, as an enablement person. Um, so that's next next week here. Uh, Kevin, thank you much. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a great weekend. Okay. Thank you, Pete, for having me. You too. All right. Okay, later. Bye.